Hi everyone, and welcome to this online discovery session about Anglican AIDS Bible College student sponsorships. My name is Tim Swan. I'm the CEO of Anglican Aid. And tonight you're gonna to be hearing about an amazing opportunity that God is giving us to be able to raise up biblically faithful pastors and church leaders and see communities transformed across the developing world. I'm coming to you, uh, speaking to you today from Moore College where I studied and, and where many of your ministers would have studied. Uh, because we know that under God, the church rises or falls on the strength of training given to its ministers. Sadly, across the developing world, many pastors have had only a minimal level of training. But tonight is about helping change that around. We're going to be hearing from an amazing lineup of speakers on the impact that sponsoring a student can have on strengthening a church, a diocese, and even a nation for all of eternity. But first I want to tell you why, as a former missionary, I think that sponsoring a student is perhaps the most strategic investment you can make in the Kingdom of God. Uh, when I was 21, I went on a short-term mission trip to Papua New Guinea, and we uh, visited a series of churches across the highlands. Uh, churches full of people eager to hear from God but churches where pastors were often very inadequately trained and struggled to handle the Word of God. And on that mission trip, we thought, how can this be when in Australia we have so many resources to share? Well, later, Sally and I went as missionaries to Chile to teach at a Bible college. And many of the students came from contexts where they were heavily involved in ministry, but just lacked the resources to be able to afford to go to a Bible college for further training. Fortunately, CMS Australia sponsored many of these students, and I was able to see the impact that these uh, students have, uh, that the impact that a couple of years of sponsorship from Australia had enabling these uh, students to be able to study and then go out into a lifetime of faithful Christian ministry. Uh, not like a foreign missionary uh, like us, who were there for a time, but equipped locally for a lifetime of local ministry in their local context and culture. And so I think the most effective way of strengthening the church around the world is through sponsoring Bible College students. And since I've started at, at uh, Anglican Aid, I have had bishop after bishop and, and, and church leaders from all over the, around the world calling me and saying, can you help us train our people in the Bible? Can you help train our people for ministry? And that's what tonight is about, because I think we can help. So I want to hand you over now to Dr. Peter Jensen uh, to share with us this evening's keynote address. And Dr. Jensen is the uh, Director of the Theological Education Network for GAFCON, a former Archbishop of Sydney, former Principal of Moore College here, and he'll be speaking to us on why theological education in the developing world is vital. So over to you, Peter. Hello, everyone, and good evening. My wonderful job today is to talk to you about theological education. A few years ago, I attended a conference in Uganda at the Christian University there, which incorporates the old Bishop Tucker Theological College. It was a wonderful conference, uh, and uh, there were about 20 people there, but they represented uh, theological colleges and theological education from around the world, uh, both from the UK and from Canada, if I remember correctly, from uh, Australia, of course, but mainly from Africa and Asia. And did I learn a lot? <laughs> I truly did. One of the things we talked about, in fact, the first thing on the agenda was, what are the difficulties involved in theological education, particularly in the developing world, but of course, everywhere? And it was interesting to hear the answers and to hear 
how the answers were much the same almost wherever you are. Uh, some of the difficulties, of course, and you can imagine this, a lack of resources, uh, building buildings, libraries. I'll never forget visiting a seminary in Nigeria, for example, and being taken to the library and, and books from here had been given to that and how, how proud they were, how delighted they were and how pleased I was to see those books being used in that seminary in Nigeria. So resources was a key issue, but it's not just resources. There's the whole question of the state of the churches and, and you're probably aware that uh, in so many of the countries of Asia and Africa, the church is exploding. It's uh, evangelism is going on. People are coming to know the Lord. There's large numbers of people. But this poses a problem, poses the problem of training. And unfortunately, so many of those who take the responsibility of being pastor teachers have not themselves been taught. Uh, there is lack of training. It doesn't, it's not their fault. It is simply that the church is expanding and someone needs to take that responsibility. But as a result too, uh, what my friends in Uganda were telling me was that that means that the churches are exposed to, if you like, false teaching. Uh, that it's easy for those who teach a social gospel, for example, who promote liberalism or who promote uh, prosperity teaching. It's so easy for them to come in and take the church members away because our people haven't been taught the deep and significant truths of the Word of God because their leaders haven't been taught. And then there's the whole business uh, that uh, folk told me about, about the status of theological education within the churches themselves and how, and this may strike you as strange, but uh, not all the leadership of the churches truly values the theological colleges. Um, and sometimes people are sent to teach at the colleges who are not really equipped to do so. Uh, and then sometimes when you have a college which is doing well and people graduate from the college, and this may be the first uh, tertiary education they've ever had, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will go into the ministry. It may mean that they will go into the public service or something like this because they have a tertiary uh, qualification. Now, some of these things, let me say, are, just remind me of our society 50 years ago. So it's not particularly a problem for them. Uh, it's a problem with theological education. Lack of resources, lack of support, lack of understanding of what's really involved in the whole business of theological education and where it needs to get to. I think one of the questions that you may have at this very moment is, are we trying to impose Western theological education on developing countries? Would it, uh, are we trying to create new universities, new Oxford, Cambridge, when they're actually not suited culturally? Well, that's a fair question. But it was interesting listening to my friends for it's clear that in so many of the developing countries the desire for really strong tertiary education, sure, modelled on what is usual in the West, is very strong indeed. And it's all very well for us to sit here and say, oh well, you know, we don't want to impose the culture but my experience was that people want some of the very things that we have. However, and it's a big however, our way of doing things needs to be brought in in their way of doing things, if I can put it like that. It needs to suit the culture into which it goes. I don't doubt that. And uh, we need to be very, very sensitive. And, to be good listeners, to see what's there. So one of the reasons for having this conference in Uganda, which was uh, eye-opening for me, um, was to listen, for me to listen, for me to hear, and for each of us to hear, what really constituted good theological education. We were aiming to come up with some results which would 
be true if you had a little group of people under a tree somewhere in the outback, or if you were in one of the high prestige universities. What is the essence of theological education was what we were going for. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Oh, one of the things I forgot too was that in the, in the, in the developing world where governments are trying to bring in university education, uh, sometimes they are saying to the churches, and you must match us. You must develop, and, and fair enough. But your seminaries can't, can no longer be sort of uh, <laughs> gumtree seminaries. You have got to be producing good results. And I think that's fair. But it's hard, particularly if you don't have the resources. Oh, and by the way, one of the reasons for the lack of resources is the sheer number of people getting converted, praise the Lord, and the sheer number of young people being converted, praise the Lord. So we're dealing with a problem of success, really, not so much a problem of failure, bear that in mind. Now let's think about theological education for a moment and some of the results of this conference as we talked about it. What is the essence of it? Why do we have it? Well, I always think we have it because it's in the Bible. Uh, the first theological college, Deuteronomy 6. Do you know what I mean? It's the home. It's the parents teaching the children. The book of Proverbs. It's the parents teaching the children. That's the prime theological college. Mind you, if the parents don't know, then they're not going to be able to teach the children very well. Now, one of the interesting things about the picture of church we have in the New Testament, and I, I've learnt this from my friend and colleague, Dr. Claire Smith, uh, who did her PhD in this area, is that the churches of the New Testament were, in a sense, like schools. Now, that, you don't say that they're the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, all those things, true. But in a very significant way, they are also, what shall I say, learning, teaching communities where people learn. And one of, the great, one of the great signs of an effective church is that people are learning Christ. And in that way, being guarded against the false teachers, as well as growing into the likeness of Christ together, which is our business. So in a sense, the second theological college is the church. But then, of course, the Lord gives pastor teachers who will teach in the church. They're not the only teachers, the parents are teachers, for example, but the pastor teachers. And my observation over many, many years is as follows, that generally speaking, a church cannot rise above the level of the pastor teacher or teachers in the church. It's not always the case, but it's generally the case. And a denomination cannot rise above the level of its theological seminaries. If they are weak, the diocese will be weak. The denomination will be weak. If they are strong, then it's not inevitable, of course, but then there is every chance that the churches will be strong. And if the churches are strong, then the families will be strong because we will be producing, it's a great word, isn't it? Disciples, disciples, learners. Hence the importance of making sure that in these growing churches with many, many young people and many challenges, we provide the best theological education. And what does that look like? Well. I'll tell you what we thought. We thought that you ask these questions, and this will get to the heart, no matter if you're teaching a, a small little group somewhere or a large group. These are the questions. First of all, why? Why are you doing this? And the answer has to be, the fundamental answer has to be, we are doing this in order to know God through his word and by his spirit, to know God so that we may make him known. You don't go to college in order to get degrees and diplomas and big things on your shoulders. You go to college to know God. And indeed, if the teachers do not wish to know God, then it's not, not a very good college. 
So you go to college in order to know God. That's why you're there. And to enable, be enabled to make him known. Why? Next question. What? How do you know God? Well, preeminently, you know God through his revelation of himself in his word. And so, the substance of what we do is to study the word of God. It's very strange indeed that in recent years, in some seminaries around the world, the word of God has been sidelined and people are more interested in that subject or this subject and how to be... No. Whatever the, te whatever the seminary does, and it must do a number of things, it has to be centred on the word of God, understood to be the infallible, trustworthy, sufficient, comprehensive, comprehensible word of God. That's the substance of the agenda, because that's what we do in church, and that's what you do with your children at home. Why? What? And then the question. Who? And in a sense, this is the big question. No, they're all important. Who? When I, look at a, when I go online and look at a theological seminary and just see what it's about, I always try to see who's teaching there. It's not a You could have the crummiest little set of buildings and, you know, a tiny library and who knows what. The question is, who teaches? And that's the issue. Too many seminaries, particularly in the Western world, have been gone down the path of academic excellence, and they'll employ people who have got their PhDs and can glory in knowledge. Well, I'm a believer in PhDs and having knowledge, but I want the people teaching in the seminary, in word and in life, to be those who love God, who love the knowledge of God, and who are the pastor teachers that they are hoping will come to the seminary and go forth from the seminary. And I'm hoping that the people who come to the seminary are those who are already pastor teachers in their homes, in their churches, and who come to the seminary in order to grow in their knowledge of God. Who teaches and who comes is a vital question. And then finally, how? How do you do this? Well, these days, um, we're blessed, aren't we, with uh, online learning and all sorts of other things like this, and I think there's a place for that. But, you know, you don't do family online, do you? Because, you know, in the end, we learn from each other. It's, uh, it takes resources. It takes effort. But bringing people together into a community of learning and teaching is, I think, pretty well vital for producing Christian pastor teachers. Oh, one other thing. What level? What level should we do this at? I would say this. Whatever level the school teachers have in your community, whatever level training they have, pastor teachers in the churches should have pretty well the same level. Now, in some places, that'll mean that the local school teacher has been maybe done a school course and maybe a, a, a short teacher training course. Well, I think the pastor teacher will be at least that and maybe not much more. But in other places, the school teachers have far higher qualifications. Well, we can't allow the churches in the pastor teachers of the churches to be less qualified. That's what I'd say. So, in summary, is it important? You bet it is. Is it vital? I personally, I, through GAFCON, I'm the leader of the Theological Education Network in GAFCON. Friends, I wouldn't be doing this if I did not think that this was the single biggest issue facing our churches today. And anything you can do to support the work of making sure that the churches all around the world have excellent theological education available, by which I don't mean huge buildings and wonderful degrees, but the right aim, the right people,
the right syllabus and the right method, anything you can do will be worth doing. And you know, one of the great things that's happened in my time, in these last few years in other words, is the work that Anglican Aid is doing to support this. Because through, through the wisdom of the leadership of Anglican Aid, they have seen the very point I've just been making. And although their work, of course, covers a number of things, and so it should, pretty important to Anglican Aid is theological education. Good. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you, Peter, for your clarity and wisdom there and, uh, and for your com commendation of our Bible College student sponsorship program. We indeed are investing uh, in the training and raising up of more pastor teachers uh, right across Africa and beyond. And we hope that many people viewing this event live uh, or online afterwards will partner with us in this effort. Peter mentioned some of the challenges that are confronting the church across the world. Uh, the sheer number of converts and the, the lack of resources. Uh, well, to help us get more of a sense of what this is like on the ground in Africa. I'd like now to welcome Pastor Samuel Majok. Samuel came as a refugee to Australia from Sudan, and he's now the pastor of the Oakhurst South Sudanese Congregation at Oakhurst Anglican Church. And he also advises us at Anglican Aid on all things South Sudan. Please welcome him. My name is Pastor Samuel K. Majuk. I'm going to talk to you about the challenges of preaching the gospel in Africa. The first generation of Christians obeyed Jesus Christ's commission that go to the walls and take the gospel. And by the power of the Holy Spirit and because of God's grace, they achieved astonishing changes from individual to society. But sometimes we forgot that today we have the same gospel spirit. Therefore, Christian leaders in Africa must be committed to gospel teaching and evangelism. What are the challenges? First, there's a lack of enough theological training in Africa. That's the bigger and the main challenge of the preaching of the gospel in Africa. A great deal of missionaries' effort is at the present being focused on theological education. In many cases in Africa, the pastors in the cities do not have any form of theological training. Generally speaking, free business missionaries afford do not place an emphasis on, equip, on equipping the pastors who were left in charge of the churches. This absence of enduring discipleship has resulted in increasing charlo theology, leaving many local churches subject to whatever errors. There's also a case of deep concern because as church grow, so does the need for the church leaders. With estimate numbers, one pastor is in charge of over 300 to 500 congregations. That's about three churches, only to one pastor. He can travel like four to five hours a day. There's a fear. Many church ministers in Africa fear. They fear that if they emphasize on sins, people will leave church. So in order to keep the people in the church, the offensive truth of humanity before God is omitted when they preach. But people don't get saved by nice messages. They must be confronted for their sins and comforted by the Savior. If people in the church are not being changed by the message we preach, then we should ask ourselves exactly what we are preaching. Another challenge is of the preaching of the gospel in Africa is the rising of prosperity gospel. This is because it has become fashionable to talk about numbers in the church. Another challenge is that is connected to 
the gospel of prosperity is commercialism. Nowadays in Africa, the pulpit has become a place to sell anointed oils. Pulpit has become a place to sell holy water, to sell holy soils, or whatever you call it, name them. Anointed soaps, seed sowing for breaking through prayers and ETC. Paul prophets and Paul preachers are one of the greatest obstacles to effective evangelism in Africa. They emphasize that individuals with need should give away seed for their prayers to be answered. There's a seed for every need, that's what they say. They can even preach that people should give seed for salvation of their loved ones. In some cases, pastors want to retain wealthy new visitors to the church. They tend to fast track them into a membership of baptisms. Even leadership. This has been very unfortunate. In some churches, lay leaders are appointed according to the size of their wallet rather than their Christian majority. The Anglican aid, thanks to the Anglican aid and all other supporters of Bishop Queen College in South Sudan, in Juba. Anglican aid had already sponsored hundreds of full-time students in Bible colleges across Africa. We would love Anglican aid to sponsor more such students, such leaders, so that they can positively impact their churches and do well at their ministry's level. For example, let me introduce you to my brother, Reverend John Jal. John Jal is a student sponsored by Anglican aid. John was sponsored to do his theological training at BGC. He did very well, so he won his sponsorship, his scholarship to go to South Africa at John Wetfield. John also did exceptionally well in South Africa. So he is now appointed as a bishop of Bintil Diocese in South Sudan. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In my conclusions, if the Gospels is going to thrive on our continent of Africa, then we must train men and women who are committed to the Holy Gospel that save, confidence in sovereign God, who fear God, who hears our prayers. Thank you so much. May peace and love of God be with you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Samuel. It's amazing to hear of uh, the situation on the ground and the urgency that there is for uh, training up more pastors. Amazing to hear some of those stories and circumstances that Samuel describes. And God willing, Anglican Aid will be part of this solution of, of uh, training up more people in Sudan and beyond. So to help us to understand how Bible colleges can solve the problems that Samuel has outlined, uh, I've invited Kylie Zeech, CMS missionary and Dean of Women at Johannesburg Bible College, one of our partner colleges, to share about the life-changing work of Bible training. Uh, but first, we're going to watch a short clip from her colleague, Nan Klunka. My name is Ndlandla Zwane, and I am a pastor in South Africa, Soweto. We run a church there. It's a very young church with young people, uh, age-wise and even the number of ministries a new fairly new ministry but now we when we started the ministry we realized that we needed a training because we were not used to running church we were serving under other people and we really did not know the other side of actually running the ministry and jpc helped me to put this structure inside of us and not only putting the structure jpc became a theological anchor for the people because for the longest time we were used to teachings that only excite and exalt. We never used the teachings that develop critical thinking. We were not used to teachings that actually shape the character of a person that they begin to view the world from the biblical perspective. This JPC has achieved the inside of me. And when I came to JPC, I was challenged in the way I taught. 
and <laughs> I remember when I went back and threw away all my sermons just to bring Christ-centered sermons. That's my colleague Nang Klankla, who I met in 2018 when he came to JBC to study. And he actually started studying just one day a week and then he loved it so much he switched into full time. And he finished um, the first year course and he um, was so passionate and his life had changed so much. When he became a Christian, um, he started preaching and teaching. Um, but he would have called himself more of a motivational speaker. God's word wasn't central to what he taught. Um, and so when he came to JBC and had the Bible opened up before him and came through the classes, he was struck that he hadn't been teaching the beauty of the gospel. And so it's a real privilege to work with him um, at JBC. And I enjoy teaching different subjects. Um, particularly, he's been working alongside me um, with the biblical care and counseling classes and he's um, been really helping looking at how healing can happen in an African context. I've learned a lot from Nung Klankla. I think he um, is passionate about Jesus and he's passionate about bringing particularly apologetics. How can he connect with the African worldview and how can he um, engage with people who um, from kind of his a similar background. So he's been very helpful on the staff team I think getting us to think about how we can connect um, the Christian life with um, some African traditional beliefs and current beliefs as well. And so he's kind of been working hard at trying to make those connections for us. For the students who are sponsored through Anglican Aid, they're going to be learning Handling God's Word, which is one of our foundational courses where we look deeply at the Bible, particularly at Colossians, Mark and Exodus. And they're learning the skills of deeply um, studying God's word. And so through that, we're encouraging them to read the rest of God's word. A student who is sponsored through Anglican Aid would also be looking at faith to live by, be looking at some of the key doctrines that are found in the Bible, which is really, really encouraging. We begin in Genesis, looking at Genesis 1. And every year I'm struck that some women have never heard the fact that they're equal to a man and that they're made in God's image. And then we move from looking at the Old Testament to Jesus. How does Jesus teach women? And again, every year there is often tears as women see the treatment that Jesus, the value, the love um, that he gives to the place of women. So we have students who are doing many different things. We have a lot who are who were currently running churches, who continue to run churches, but who are now well equipped. We have some who are working with university students. We have some who are running children's ministries, outreach to the community. We've had people who are social workers who just want to be better equipped in how to be a Christian social worker. We have um, some who are a part of Christian NGOs, but at Johannesburg Bible College, we're aiming to reach not just people from a reformed evangelical background. We have students from every single church that come to us, which can be exciting. Um, but it's interesting, the discussions we have over tea and coffee, the places and churches they come from, sometimes are very, very far from um, the Bible. I've been encouraged that the men and women who come to Johannesburg Bible College, who who learn God's word deeper and who are equipped more, don't just keep what they're learning to themselves. It's so exciting to hear stories of students who, who learn, for example, about um, what the Bible has to say about sexuality and then are keen to go straight away to their family, to their church or their community and teach those around them about it. For example, they might get straight onto a taxi or maybe they're on a train and they, they share what they've been learning at JBC with the people on the train, with the people on the taxi, whether they want to hear it or not. And so it's exciting that they're not keeping what they're learning to themselves. So in one sense, by training and teaching and equipping these men and women, they're passing on the baton um, to their families. Their family members are coming to Christ or their family members are growing in Christ. And then they're using those skills in their churches. The, the amount of women who've gone and started small group Bible studies um, after we've done the Bible study leading and the assessment they have to do is incredible. And they often talk, why haven't we been doing this before? And they realise because they've never been taught how to do a Bible study before. 
And so in one sense, it's a bit of a ripple effect. And so if change is to happen in Johannesburg, if change is to happen within um, churches, it begins with one person at a time being gra um, gripped by the gospel and understanding God's word and then passing that on to others. He said to me, Ndanda, make sure that your church is built on the foundation of the word. Don't let the circumstances, your emotions and your desires be the foundation of your church. Don't let the marketing gimmicks and the marketing strategies to be the foundation of your church. Let the word of God be the foundation of the church. And we did exactly that. And when we did that, this is what I observed from the congregation. The congregation started thinking differently. They started asking right questions. They shaped their lives. Remember, we are running a very young church. This church is young. The oldest in our church is 47 years. Actually, I'm the oldest, 47 years. And then we've got 30 something people and they are impressionable. They are materialistic. They want to climb corporate ladders. They want the status of the community and all that. But when we started teaching the gospel, they downgraded, they invested in right things, they, they paid attention to their relationships more, they wanted to participate in the community, in the church. It's, it's changing the way they look at life. Then I thought this is such a brilliant thing. And then this is what we, I gained at JPC. Today I'm studying towards my degree I am growing in my walk with God in terms of theological understanding and this is JPC and I'm so grateful for the experience that I had in JPC. Goodbye. Thanks Kylie and what a great testimony to the way that Bible college training can impact many lives. Anglican Aid is thrilled to be able to partner with uh, many colleges right across Africa from the south to the, to the north, uh, including Johannesburg Bible College and George Whitfield uh, College in the south, right up to Alexandria School of Theology in Egypt in the north. So now we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Ashley Null, President of the Board of Alexandria School of Theology, and from Dr. Sami Shahata, Principal of the College. Anglican Aid has been uh, wonderful since we started 2005. So thank you very much for supporting us. Our students in Alexander School of Theology come from different backgrounds. We are known for our solid biblical teaching. Uh, we teach Orthodox, Catholics, Baptists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, they all members of Alexander School of Theology. It's really exciting as the chairman of the board to 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 watch all the hard work that's, that's gone in to forming this, this institution, the dedication, uh, the biblical faithfulness, and the goal to, uh, to change lives through the gospel message. The strength of the Diocese of Sydney has always been more theological college, an institution clearly committed to biblical exposition and raising up faithful expositors generation after generation. That's exactly what we hope uh, AST will continue to be for decades to come, a faithful institution committed to biblical exposition. But, and that is incredibly important for the Diocese of Egypt, we are in the midst of a cultural war within Anglicanism. And so often, biblical, faithful biblical exposition is seen as a Western idea being imposed upon the rest of the community. As Alexandria School of Theology continues to strengthen as an institution of biblical faithfulness in Africa, led by Africans, it will... Uh, have a great deal of influence in shaping mainstream Anglicanism in the 21st century to be based on faithful biblical exposition as the 39 articles calls for. And therefore, when people sponsor students, they're not only helping that student, which is incredibly important,
but they're investing in an institution that will increasingly play an important role in shaping the future of the communion. Personally, I had the privilege of going to our campus in Tunis, working, uh, giving a class to nine Muslim background believers. And to be moved by their stories, their sacrifice, their faithfulness, and their hunger to be taught more of scripture so that they can uh, strengthen the church and its outreach. Bishop Sammy, uh, what do you think about the folks enrolled? They're wonderful. Uh, some of them are going to be working in ministry and some of them is going to be full-time, uh, hopefully ordained in the Anglican, in the Anglican church. Yeah, and the other, the other thing I, I really uh, didn't mention that uh, part of our ministry in Alexander School of Theology is helping uh, Sudanese and uh, refugees, which Dr. Ashley mentioned. We have Nuba Mountain in Cairo, helps Sudanese to come to Egypt, study for intensive. We have this new program, have an intensive for clergy to come and spend a full year studying and then going back to Sudan to continue their ministry. In Gambella, we have 140 churches. And we train leaders uh, from all these uh, churches. Actually, uh, every year we have a big budget uh, for teaching and for movement between the different churches. And the expense of each student will range between 1,500 US and 2,000. Uh, by our standard, Egyptians cannot pay, probably they can pay 10% out of this uh, amount. 10% uh, is, not, uh, is not a lot. So uh, Anglican Aid has been very supportive in helping us to train many students from the Anglican Church and from the other churches. And we, we invest in our relation with other churches. We train people and people go to their churches and they are ordained there. So we invest in good education and we now need for our uh, really uh, conservative uh, biblical uh, strong teaching in, in Egypt. And so when you sponsor um, a student, you're literally keeping the doors of AST open because we can't survive without sponsorships. We are um, doing long range planning and, and endowment development and all good institutional advancement, but those take time and years and Therefore, the support today for the students, um, whether in Cairo or um, in Tunis or um, uh, in any of our branches, um, uh, it's critical for today's mission to go forward, for people to hear Jesus say, please give. So uh, God bless you for all you do. And uh, I pray and Hope that we will continue this uh, strong uh, partnership. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ashley and, and Sammy, for those words. And it's really a privilege that Anglican Aid can be involved in supporting students at Alexandria School of Theology. Well, we've now heard about the need for well-trained leaders across the developing world. Uh, we've heard how Bible College student sponsorships can really make a difference in giving opportunities that would otherwise not be available. And we know that in Australia that we've been blessed financially. And let me tell you again, more and more bishops and leaders across the world are calling Sydney saying, can you help us in training our people, especially in the scriptures? So can you help us train our people? What a question. And I want to put that to you. Can you help? Many churches, of course, sponsor Compassion Children, which is fantastic. Many churches sponsor CMS Missionaries, fantastic. But imagine if every church across Sydney and Australia and every home group and maybe many individuals were able to sponsor a Bible college student and the gospel is preached and people are converted, churches are strengthened and communities are transformed. We've heard the saying, the church in Africa is a mile wide, but only an inch deep. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. We can be part of the solution tonight. 
Anglican Aid currently sponsors over 400 full-time Bible college students in Africa. We have experience in doing this. We are making a terrific contribution. So here's the question, would you be part of sponsoring a student? We've got students seeking sponsorships from countries like South Africa, Zimbabwe, Burundi, Rwanda, Tanzania, Congo, Egypt, Nepal, PNG, Chile. You'll be able to develop a personal relationship with a student. You'll receive a photo, you can put it on your fridge. You'll receive prayer letters so that you can pray for them, be a part of their ministry in an ongoing way and be part of filling the urgent need for well-trained pastors across the developing world. So how much would it cost to sponsor a student and transform a church? How much would it cost to strengthen a church for a lifetime? Well, Anglican Aid sponsors students across a range of uh, countries in three different price brackets. Uh, more developed countries like Johannesburg Bible College, where we've heard about, or George Whitfield College, a full sponsorship for a student studying there is $12,000 a year for three years. We have mid-range countries like Zimbabwe, Sudan, Uganda uh, for around $5,400 a year. Other countries like Tanzania, Rwanda, Nepal, Madagascar, $1,600 for a, a year's sponsorship for a student. That's uh, $140 a month. Now, some of you will be able to sponsor a student at George Whitfield College for $12,000 a year, or maybe two or three students. Uh, others may think, well, I couldn't quite stretch that far, but if I talk to my Bible study group, maybe between our Bible study group, we could put together the amount to be able to sponsor a student. Or others might think, well, I know my church sponsors a CMS missionary, I know that we sponsor children, we could, as a church, perhaps sponsor a student and you might be able to put it to your church. So can I invite you to pray, Lord, would you have me be a part of this? Would you have me take part in this program? So I'm going to lead us in prayer now. And uh, if you want to be a part of this, then have a look at our website. Go to anglicanaid.org.au or give us a call and we'll be able to line you up with a student whom you can sponsor towards a lifetime of faithful ministry in the name of the Lord Jesus. So as we come to the end of, end of our night together, let me pray. Our Lord and Saviour, we want to see your gospel preached widely and preached faithfully that many, many might be saved. We long to see people across the world come to know you, to know the truth, to be filled with the fruit of your spirit, that churches might be strengthened and whole communities transformed. Lord, we pray that you will raise up and send out more workers into your harvest field. And we pray that you will raise up generous sponsors who can uh, sponsor their training at trusted Bible colleges. We pray, Lord, that you will open the hearts of your people to be generous, that we might be a blessing to many nations through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, thank you for joining this, joining us tonight uh, in this launch program for our Anglican Aid Bible College student sponsorships. Thank you.